inspiration. Taking sannyasa in Mayapur in 1994 from His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami did not mean much of a change in his lifestyle since Maharaj has always been strict in his sadhana. Whoever gets to know Maharaj admires and respects his sincere and faithful practice of chanting the holy name of the Lord. He truly walks his talk. Maharaj has been teaching with Mayapur Institute since its inception. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinasha Maharaj, Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Okay, so uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation for us. I think, did you get the PDF yesterday? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, we got the PDF. Maylin, did you also get the PDF? I, yes, Maharaj, I got it. Yeah? Well, okay. Lila Avatar Maharaj, did you also get PDF? Yes. Okay, and Sitala Mataji? Sitala, is she there? Maharaj. Hi, Krishna. Did you get the PDF? Yes. Did you look at it? Yes. You understand? Uh, some, something. <laughs> but I listening to your before class, this uh, same class, I listening to uh, 2020. Okay. Okay, so who's the host? Uh, Hare Krishna, uh, Maharaj, I am the host and I, I have made you the co-host. Oh, I'm sharing the screen. Okay, so I'll... Shall I start the recording, Maharaj? Huh? I'll start the recording. Okay. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay, so here's a, a picture of Prabhupada. This is Prabhupada in, on the beach in Mumbai, Juhu. Big beach there near the temple. Prabhupada would go to walk there in the morning and he'd talk to the devotees. This one man, Indian man, he would come talk to Prabhupada. All right. So we're studying Nectar of Devotion. Nectar of Devotion is a book written by Srila Prabhupada based on a book written by Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami is one of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan. Right? Rupa Goswami was the brother of Sanatan Goswami, the two brothers, Rupa and Sanatan. So the, they were both sent to Vrindavan by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So there's a nice song about the Goswamis. It's called the Sri Sri Sad Goswami Asteka. Just like we chant every day the Shikshastika, Asteka means eight. So there are eight prayers about the Goswamis. This is the second prayer. Nana Shastra Vichari Naikanepanao Sad Dharma Samstapako Lokanam hitakari no tribuvane manyo sharanyakaro Radha Krishna padaravinda bhajana nandaina mataliko bande rupa sanatano ragujago shri jiva gopala go. Right? That's the nice song. Here you can see the meaning. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis. Rupa Goswami, right? We're studying his book. 
the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And Prabhupada wrote to come back online again. There's always internet problems here. Okay, so the six Goswamis, and their names are all there. And they're very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. Alright, so that's the second verse, right? We won't look at all. There's Srila Prabhupada. This is Srila Prabhupada in his final, final month in Vrindavan, 1977, November. Prabhupada was still recording. He had already written the Nectar of Devotion. The Nectar of Devotion was written very early in the beginning of the movement. So here, in this the picture here, Prabhupada was dictating this was the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada was giving the purports to the tenth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, we'll go ahead. Srila Rupa Goswami's Pranama. We offer a prayer to Rupa Goswami. Here's Rupa Goswami. You see the Goswamis, they, they, were, they were Babaji's. They were different from the Vaishnava sannyasi. They were Babaji's. Babaji's are more advanced than sannyasi's. They were Babaji's. They were white cloth and very short cloth, dhoti, very short, and no sewn cloth, and they have a water pot and their bead bag, and that's their possessions. So they live very simply. So we offer a prayer to Rupa Goswami. Maybe you know this prayer. Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swa Padantikam. Hmm? Often we say, when we say the prayers to all the Acharyas, we will often say this. First we will say Om Magyana Timaran, and then we will say Sri Chaitanya Manubhistam. So here's the meaning. When will Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada? who has established within this material world the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya, give me shelter under his lotus feet. So we pray to Rupa Goswami like that. We want to get shelter under his lotus feet. Lord Rupa Goswami was a a direct disciple of Lord Chaitanya. This is another song about the Goswamis. It's a famous song and it was written by a great devotee called Naratama Das Thakur. So the song, the title of the song is Lala Samai Prartana. Prartana means prayer. And Lala Samai means you have a very strong desire to get this. A very strong desire to achieve something. So you can see the translation. When I am eager to understand the literature given by the Goswamis, then I shall be able to understand the transcendental loving affairs of Radha and Krishna. Right? Are you all eager to understand the literature given by the Goswamis? 
I think you must be. Yes, I think you must be, because you've, you're taking this Bhakti Shastri course here. So it means you're very eager to understand the loving affairs of Radha and Krishna. So, Rupa Raghunatha Pade Haibe Akuti Kabe Hamabhujahabase Yugala Priti. This is the song. Sometimes you'll hear devotees sing the song. Prabhupada sings it very beautifully. You can hear Prabhupada sing. Okay, so we're going into the book, The Nectar of Devotion, which is the complete science of Bhakti Yoga. Prabhupada, I said, he wrote this book very early in the beginning of our movement. And he told us, he said, this is like the handbook, the handbook for devotees. He said, tell you everything about devotional service. <laughs> oh, here's, this is a prayer. This is a prayer from the Srimad Bhagavatam. First canto, second chapter, fifth verse. Munaya sadu prishto ham bhavad bir loka mangalam yakrita krishna samprasno yenatma suprasidati. Right, this is Sutta Goswami. Sutta Goswami was answering the questions put by the sages. The sages mean Naimasharanya, the Naimasharanya sages. And Sutta Goswami said, Ah, oh, I have been justly questioned by you. Your questions are worthy because they relate to Lord Krishna and so are of relevance to the world's welfare. Only questions of this sort are capable of completely satisfying the Self. So, Sutta Goswami was very pleased with the questions put by the sages of Naimasharanya. So we're going to have twelve lessons on the nectar of devotion. Twelve lessons means we'll go over two weeks. It won't just be two weeks. We'll have to have a few more days to finish everything, I think. We'll see. Anyway, so these are the lessons. Today we're doing lesson one, entering the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. The Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, remember, that is the title of the book written by Rupa Goswami. And Prabhupada wrote his book on it and he called it The Nectar of Devotion. All right, and then tomorrow we'll hear about the definition of pure devotional service. Okay, today, lesson one, entering the Bhakti Ras Amrita Sindhu. We're not going to go very far. We're only going to do one, we're, we won't cover the whole book. We're only going to do the first section of the book. We won't look at all the details about Ras, but we will read the first section, which is very good for us. Good for us to understand Bhakti Yoga. All right, so the preface of the book explains the brief history We'll hear about the history behind writing the book and uh, Bhakti Yoga. And then we'll hear about Rupa Goswami, the, his author and his importance, very famous devotee, Rupa Goswami, very important person. And remember, he's a direct disciple of Lord Chaitanya. And we will also explain the meaning of the term Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Some of you may not know what is the meaning, so we will explain that today. 
All right, so first the history. Here's Rupa Goswami. You see how he's writing? He didn't have any laptop computer. He doesn't even have a typewriter. How is he writing his books? Does he have any paper? Does he have any notebook? He's writing on palm leaves. He would get some... Can you hear me okay? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you, but in between your, your video is getting stuck for a few seconds. Oh, video is getting stuck? Really? For, just for a few seconds. Uh -huh. But you can hear me okay, huh? Yes, 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 yes. Because it told me the computer is unstable again. Okay. So, this is Rupa Goswami, and he, he wrote his books on palm leaves. There were no ballpoint pens even. Somehow he would get some piece of little metal and a little, I don't know what he would use for ink. But they wrote the books. And, and Rupa Goswami had very beautiful handwriting. When, when he was staying in Jagannath Puri, he was writing and Lord Chaitanya came. And Lord Chaitanya saw the book and saw his writing. And he said, oh, it's so beautiful. Handwriting was so nice. Nowadays, some people, you know, I don't know, my handwriting is so terrible. And often we find people, <laughs> their handwriting is so bad that you can't read it. Hmm. So Rupa Goswami, his handwriting was very beautiful and he would write everything on palm leaf. So he wrote this nectar of devotion, this uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, he wrote it also on palm leaves. And if you go to Vrindavan, in Vrindavan there's a library there, it's called the Vrindavan Research Institute. And if you go there you'll find out that they have some of the original books of Rupa Goswami, written 500 years ago on palm leaves, and they have the palm leaves there, preserved in Vrindavan. Amazing. And I, we have some things in Calcutta also, in Calcutta also there's, an, there, we have our Bhaktivedanta Research Institute, and they have some of the original books of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, which is not like Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami's 500 years ago. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is like 100, 150 years ago. Okay, so this is Rupa Goswami. He would sit under a tree in Vrindavan and write his books. So we want to explain about the important position of Rupa Goswami. Right? Do you know who this person is? Sitala? Who is this person? Do you know who this, this is? Brahma. How do you know it's Brahma? My Papaji told me. Huh? My Papaji is here, he told me. Oh, Sorry. your Prabhuji told you. Oh. But, so how did he know it's Brahma? You don't know how to recognize Brahma? It's four. It's four. Oh, it has four heads. Yes, right. Very good. Yes, he has four heads, right. In this universe, Brahma has four heads. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if he has to eat with each of the heads. Does he have to eat four, four, four plates? <laughs> or is one plate enough for him? Okay. Any... Anyway, we're hearing Lord Brahma is described here before the creation of this cosmic manifestation. The Lord enlightened the heart of Lord Brahma with the details of the creation and manifested the Vedic knowledge. Yes, before the creation, 
who exists before the creation. Before the creation, there was the Supreme Lord and there was also Brahma. Lord Brahma had taken birth, but there was no creation done yet. Lord Brahma has to do some work to create the different bodies of the people. He makes the bodies. The elements were there, but Lord Brahma has to combine them and he has to put the planets in position and things like that. So the Vedic knowledge was given to the heart of Brahma. The Vedic knowledge was given into the heart of Brahma at the beginning of the creation. It is said, Ten he Brahma rudaya adi kovoye, that Lord Krishna put the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Lord Brahma. So, in the same way, right, you see, in exactly the same way, the Lord, being anxious to revive the Vrindavan pastimes of Lord Krishna, impregnated the heart of Rupa Goswami with spiritual potency. By this potency, Srila Rupa Goswami could revive the activities of Krishna in Vrindavan. Activities almost lost to memory. In this way, he spread Krishna consciousness throughout the world. So this is taken from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, described there. So at the beginning of the creation, Krishna gave the Vedic knowledge to the heart of Brahma. So in the same way, in the same way, Srila Rupa Goswami got knowledge about the activities of Krishna in Vrindavan. Who gave him the knowledge and who gave Rupa Goswami the knowledge? Who would give him the knowledge? Anybody? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Yes, right. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, right. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu put into the heart, impregnated, put into the heart of Rupa Goswami. And then he gave him the knowledge about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, the Vrindavan pastimes. It said, the Lord, the Lord, meaning Lord Chaitanya, who is very anxious to revive the Vrindavan pastimes of Lord Krishna. Before Lord Chaitanya, Vrindavan was not well known. It was a very small place. There were some temples, but there were not many temples, and there were not many people. It was a very quiet village. But gradually, gradually, more and more people came. More and more people came. The village became bigger. Gradually, gradually, that village became like town. And then it, after some time, it's not just a town, it's a city. So Lord Chaitanya, he wanted people to know about the activities of Krishna in Vrindavan. Because they'd been almost lost. People didn't even know where is Radha Kund. Lord Chaitanya discovered Radha Kund. It was Lord Chaitanya who went there and he was asking people, where is Radha Kund? And then nobody knew. Then Lord Chaitanya himself, he found out, he knew where is Radha Kund. And he showed everyone in this field, in the middle of a rice field, that was Radha Kund. Now, Govardhan Hill, everybody knew that. Govardhan Hill was known. Yamuna River, everybody knows Yamuna River. But they didn't know the place of the pastimes. They didn't know the place where all the different demons were killed. So the Goswamis went to Vrindavan and they had to discover all these things. So the same way Rupa Goswami, 
He went to Vrindavan and he had to discover the places of Krishna's activities. And he, they all, the Goswamis then also built a temple. So it mentioned here, from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says, by entering the heart of Rupa Goswami. Who entered the heart? Yes? Who Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu entered his heart, right? To, to ascertain, first of all, oh well, to empower, empower Rupa Goswami. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu empowered Rupa Goswami so that he could ascertain properly the conclusions of all truths. So Lord Chaitanya gave him gave Rupa Goswami the power to understand to understand all the teachings of the scriptures. He made him an experienced devotee. Lord Chaitanya made Rupa Goswami an experienced devotee whose decisions correctly agreed with the verdicts of the disciplic succession. There Sri Rupa Goswami was personally empowered by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Right? So Rupa Goswami was empowered. What was he empowered to do? To find out the various uh, places of Leela of Sri Radha and Krishna. Yes, and what else? To ascertain, the to ascertain properly the... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Maharaji. To ascertain properly the conclusions of all the truths. Yes, right. Yes. The, the conclusions of all the truths. Where are the truths? Where are they? The conclusions of all the... the in the In the scriptures. In, in the revealed scriptures, the people were not properly understanding the message of the scriptures. So Rupa Goswami explained them exactly as Lord Chaitanya had ex explained them. Lord Chaitanya did not write any book himself, but he told his followers to write books. He told Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami, these people, to write books. At the same time, he, he, he told some other people they didn't have to write books. For some people, it wasn't the right... For Rupa Goswami, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, they were very qualified. They knew Sanskrit. Not everybody knew Sanskrit. Even 500 years ago, not everyone knew Sanskrit. Just like Prabhupada. Prabhupada joined the Gaudiya Math. He knew Sanskrit. Hardly anybody knew Sanskrit. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati knew. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada knew. And our own Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, he knew. But many people, they didn't know. Didn't know. So Rupa Goswami, he knew Sanskrit, and Sanatan Goswami, he knew Sanskrit. They could, they wrote wonderful books. So it's mentioned here from the again from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srila Rupa Goswami is described as the Bhakti Ras Acharya, or one who knows the essence of devotional service. His famous book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, is the science of devotional service. And by reading this book, one can understand the meaning of devotional service. So this book is written about devotional service. It was written in Sanskrit with many quotations from different scriptures all in Sanskrit. Prabhupada translated it and put it in a simple form so that we can understand it. 
So Rupa Goswami is described, he is the Bhakti Ras Acharya. Acha, what is the meaning of Acharya? Master. Huh? What does it mean? One who teaches by his example. Yes, right. One who teaches by his example. So, Bhakti Ras Acharya. He's teaching about Bhakti Ras by his example. Bhakti Ras. We'll hear about the meaning of Ras. All right, who would like to read for us now? My voice is getting tired. Who can read? May I? Yes, please. Okay. Srila, uh, Srila Rupa Goswami's importance. Srila Srinivasa Acharya describes in his prayers to the six Goswamis that they uh, they were all highly learned scholars and they and they very scrutinizingly studied all the Vedic scriptures in order to establish the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on the authorized principles of Vedic knowledge. The present Krishna conscious movement is all also based on the authority of Srila Rupa, Gosh Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. We are therefore generally known as Rupa Nagas or the followers of the footsteps of Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. The nectar of devotion, preface, fifth paragraph. All right. So Prabhupada said, we are generally known as Rupanugas. Rupanugas. Anugas meaning follow in the footsteps. And we follow in the footsteps of Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. Many people have the title Prabhupada. There's Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. Sanatana Goswami Prabhupada, and of course we have Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. And Prabhupada is the title for the spiritual master, for the, the powerful teacher. Prabhu means Prabhupada means a mass. Prabhu means master, and Pada means a master who has many masters at his feet. So there are many masters at the feet of someone like Rupa Goswami. So all of these people like Rupa Goswami, they knew Sanskrit. The Goswamis, these six Goswamis, they knew Sanskrit and they could translate and they could write also. They wrote the books. Okay. Anuga, follower, following in the footsteps. Okay. Yes, someone read? Prabhu, keep reading. Okay. In Golak Vrindavan, Srimati Radharani is lovingly served by eight principals, uh, gopis of whom, uh, of whom Lalita Sakhi is her dearest friend. This intimate maid servants of Srimati Radha, uh, Radhika are assisted by eight main manjaris, with Sri Rupa Manjari being the leader. Mm, yes. Just like in Mayapur, we have Radha Madhava on the altar, and then we have eight gopis, right? The eight gopis, they're called the Asta Sakis. The Sakis mean like gopis. Cowherd girls, and there are eight of them. All right? Do you know the names? Who knows the names of the Astasakis? Anybody? Yes, Maharaj. Go ahead, tell us. Lalita Sakhi, uh, Vishakha, uh, Chitra, Indulekha, Tungavidya, Rangadevi, Sudevi. Sudevi. Champalikha. Champaklikha. Champanika. Yes. Sorry. If you take it from left to right, it's Tungavidya, Chitra, Champakalata, then Lalita, then Vishaka, Indureka, Rangadevi, Sudevi. From left to right. And in the middle, of course, between Lalita and Vishaka is Radha Madhava. 
So the Astasakis, the eight gopis, there, Lalita Saki is her friend, dearest friend. Lalita Saki is very dear friend of Radharani, Srimati Radharani's best friend, Lalita Saki. And these intimate maidservants of Srimati Radhika, Radhika means also Radharani, same, are assisted by eight main manjaris. So the manjaris are younger than the gopis. The manjaris are young children, young girls. And in the spiritual world, Rupa Goswami is a manjari and he is Srila Rupa Manjari and he's the leader of the eight main manjaris. Right? So you have eight gopis. The gopis are older ladies. Not very old, they're still young girls, you know, but they're, they're, they're you know, the marriable age. And some of them, they, they, you know, they, they're supposed to get married, of course, they're married. But the Manjaris, they're very young. They don't know anything. They're young girls. So the Manjaris, because they're very young, they don't know anything about boy and girl relationships. So the Manjaris, they serve. Radha and Krishna. Because young girls, they don't get er envious. If it's an older woman, then there may be a problem. But young girls, no problem. So Rupa Goswami, he, in the spiritual body, he is Rupa Manjari. He becomes a Manjari in the spiritual world. And he's the leader of the eight Manjaris who are assisting Srimati Radharani. Is that clear? Everybody understand? Yeah? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Lil Avatar, can you understand this? Yes, I understand. Really? How about Melin? Melin? You... Yes, I understand. You know, don't be afraid to ask questions if you don't, if it's not clear, it's good, you know. Anyway, here are the names. They're the eight gopis. We heard their names, right? Lalita, Vishaka, Chitra, Induleka, Champakalata, Chungavidya, Rangadevi, Sudevi. Right? And it mentions that Lalita, in Chaitanya Lila, Lalita is Swarupa Damodar. And Vishaka, in Chaitanya Lila, she becomes Ramananda Rai. So, in, in their spiritual body, in Krishna Lila, they may be women, but in Chaitanya Lila, they become men. Do you notice that? You may be women today, but in the spiritual world you may be men. You don't know. We're not the body. All right, so those are two important. Lalita is Swarup Damodar, best friend of Radharani, and Vishaka also a very good friend of Radharani. She is Ramananda Rai. All right, talking about the Goswamis it mentioned. Should I continue? Yeah, go ahead, Prabhu. Since Lord Chaitanya's time, all the Gauriya Vaishnava Acharyas in their spiritual manjari forms where Lalita, Vishaka and uh, Radha Samsundara under the direction of Sri Rupa Manjari, Rupa Goswami. Here is a listing of the spiritual forms of the prominent Gauriya Vaishnava Acharyas, Ashta Manjaris. Srila Rupa Goswami, Rupa Manjari, Manjari. Srila Jiva Goswami, Vilas Manjari. Srila Sanatan Goswami, Lavanga Manjari. Srila Raghunatha Dasa Goswami, Roti Manjuri, 
শ্রীলা রঘুনাথ ভট্ট গোস্বামী রাগ মঞ্জুরি শ্রীলা গোপাল ভট্ট গোস্বামী আনঙ্গ মঞ্জুরি শ্রীলা লোকনাথ গোস্বামী লীলা মঞ্জু মঞ্জু লালি মঞ্জুরি শ্রীলা কৃষ্ণদাস কবিরাজ কস্তুরি মঞ্জুরি Yes, right. So this is identifying. You see, that these are the different Goswamis. From the time of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they were all there in Vrindavan serving. So, in their, in their, their spiritual bodies, in the spiritual world, they all have Manjari forms. But 500 years ago, they came from the spiritual world to take part in the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. And they came to stay in Vrindavan. And they were Goswamis. And they made their temples. When you go to Vrindavan, you can see these t temples put by these different devotees. And we see the deities also which they worshipped. Hmm? So... These are these go these Goswamis are all manjaris in the spiritual world. All right, keep reading, Prabhu. Here is a listing of the spiritual appearing, uh, ap, 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 appearing after the Ashta Manjaris, Sri uh, Narottama Das Thakur, Chamak Manjari. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, Vinod Manjari. Srila Jagannath Das Babaji, Rashika Manjari. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Kamala Manjari. Srila Gaur Kishar Das Babaji, Guna Manjari. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Nayana Manjari. <laughs> yeah, there are many Manjaris. This is, there are many, many gopis. There are many Manjaris. So these different acharyas, great spiritual teachers, they were manjaris. They had a manjari form in the spiritual world. But they came to preach Krishna consciousness. Okay. Read Prabhu. At the initiation, uh, at the initiation, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had instructed Abhay to study Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, which outlined the lo loving exchange between Krishna and his devotees and explained how a devotee can advance in spiritual life. Srila Prabhupada Lila Amrit, A Lifetime in Preparation, Chapter 4, How Shall I Serve You? All right, so... Srila Prabhupada, our Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Where did he take initiation from? Which place was he? When he got initiation? Where was he living? Prayag, Prayag Maharaj. Yes, right, Prayag, right, Prayagraj. Today it's called Prayagraj, right? Before it was called Allahabad. So, Prabhupada had gone there and he'd made a business there. He'd opened a shop there, chemist, chemist shop. He was a chemist, he was selling chemicals. And he met the Gaudiya Mat. He'd already met before Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. They had met before in Calcutta many years ago. In 1922, Bhaktivedanta Swami first met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. So 1922 they met at Uttadanga, which is a place in Calcutta. And we have a temple there today. So this year is the 100th anniversary of Prabhupada meeting Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. So Prabhupada they met there in 1922, but Prabhupada said he was a young man that time and he just married and they had children. He couldn't do very much. He was running his business. So he moved to Allahabad and then they met again 11 years later. 
So it was 1933 when Prabhupada took initiation from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. 1933. So at that time, when he got initiation, then Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati gave him the instruction. He said, you study this book by Rupa Goswami, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. He said, this is a very important book to understand Bhakti Yoga. Right? It explained here. It explains the, the exchanges between Krishna and his devotees and tells us also how we can advance in spiritual life. So, from the, his initiation, he had been given that instruction. Therefore, when Prabhupada went to America, one of the very first books which he published was The Nectar of Devotion. It was the very first book, because his guru had told him that this is an important book. So, he printed it. Okay, now, this is Rupa Goswami's Samadhi, or Bhajan Kutir, at Radha Damodar Temple. If you go there today, it does not look like this. This is an old picture. Today, now they've, they've done a huge construction, and there's a building all over the top of it. And the whole Samadhi in Bhajan Kutir is enclosed within a building. So very sad. But this was how it looked. This was actually the place of Rupa Goswami, where he studied, where he worked and wrote, and also where his Samadhi was after he left the body. So Prabhupada stayed at the Radha Damodar temple, and this place is just there, the Radha Damodar temple. And it's described, he said, this corner at the Radha Damodar temple is just like the hub of the wheel of the spiritual world. It is the center. So Prabhupada had a room there at the Radha Damodar temple. And Prabhupada referred to these rooms at Radha Damodar temple as his eternal residence, the place where he actually began his plans for the Krishna Consciousness Movement. So Prabhupada, before he went to America, he was staying at this one, this room, their small room. Have you all seen it? Have you been to Radha Damodar Temple, everyone? Lila Avatar, did you go Vrindavan yet? No, I've never been to there. No, you've never been, right? Now, what about Lin May? You also, have you been to Vrindavan? Milin, Milin. Yes. You went, huh? Yes, Guru Did you see the temple, yes, Radha Damodar? You yes, would, yes. You, I had to go to this temple. Okay. Sitala? No, my you, You've not been never. to Vrindavan? Yeah, unfortunately. You only go to Jagannath Puri, yeah? Yeah, I went to Jagannath Puri, but I didn't go to Vrindavan. Okay. So sometime you have, you believe? In the future, you have to go to Vrindavan. Yes, Mara. And you, when you go to Vrindavan, you, you want to go and see Radha Damodar Temple, and then you ask to see Prabhupada's room. Yes. <laughs> but it's not like this now, it's very different. But that's where Prabhupada began, before he went to America, after, you know, he left, he was staying in Calcutta with his family, and then he left his family, he came to Vrindavan, and he got a room there at Radha Damodar. He was staying at the Radha Damodar temple. And so he kept that room. And they still have that room. The devotees staying there, they do puja there. Okay, Prabhu, can you read this for us now? Yes. Uh, Bhakti, Bhakti Vedanta Swami daily gathered inspiration sitting before Rupa Goswami's uh, Samadhi. 
he prayed to his spiritual predecessors for guidance. The intimate direction he received from them was an absolute dictation and no government, no publisher, nor anyone else could shake or diminish it. Rupa Goswami wanted him to go to the West. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wanted him to go to the West. Krishna had arranged that he be brought to, to Radha Damodar temple to receive their blessings. At the Radha Damodar temple, he felt he had entered an eternal residence known only to pure devotees of the Lord. Yet, although they were allowing him to associate intimately with them in the place of their pastimes, they were ordering him to leave to leave Radha Damodar and Vrindavan and to deliver the message of Acharyas to the forgetful parts of the world. Oh, thank you Prabhu, yes. So, we have to understand this carefully. Now, Rupa Goswami, he lived there 500 years ago. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he gave the instruction to Prabhupada. Well, Prabhupada got initiation 1933, then Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati departed from the world 1936. So, three years later, Prabhupada was initiated only three years and then his guru left the world. So, how did they give instruction to Prabhupada? How did they tell him he had to go to the West? Anybody know? Krishna Maharaj? Yes. Maharaj, a few days ago when Bhakti Siddhan Sasri Thakur Maharaj was about to leave, so Prabhupada has written a letter to uh, Bhakti Siddhan Thakur asking what, how can he serve him. So Bhakti Siddhan Thakur Maharaj has repeated the instruction which he has given him in 1922 that you go to Western countries and preach in English language. Well, he didn't directly say go to Western countries. But what he did say was, you're good in English, so you could use your English in preaching. You know, that was more the, you know, but you could understand that, of course, if he wants to go to the West, he could also go. But the, the, the message was, you know, that you use your English for preaching. So Prabhupada understood that, you know, he was encouraging him to try to preach to the world. Don't just preach only in India, because English is the international language. So he said, think on a, you know, a bigger scale. So it mentions here that Prabhupada had been brought to Radha Damodar temple to receive their blessings. So did Rupa Goswami, how, how could he give blessings? He had lived there 500 years ago. How could he give blessings? Krishna Maharaj? Yes. So, is it that uh, Srila Prabhupada was um, uh, very spiritually elevated so he could, uh, uh, he could get the message of uh, his predecessors even in the form of, um, you know, even if they were not physically around, he could still receive their message. Yes. Because he was supposed to be Yes, right, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes in the dream, Prabhupada would have a dream, his guru would appear to him in the dream and tell him to go. You have to go. Sometimes, of course, sometimes, first of all, his guru was coming and telling him, you have to take sannyas, you have to take sannyas. And he did so different things. So, in, in, at least in their, in their uh, spiritual form, they would come. Here you can see, here you can see, like here, shown here. Go ahead, Prabhu, read. So, when you went to Vrindavan, you would be given up the idea of coming to the West. No, coming to the West 
the idea was there but i was planning how to go how to go there how to preach there how to take some books how to bring them everything alone so as soon as you had some books then you were yes then i decided everything was being dictated by a superior with shrila prabhupad in such a <clears throat> Conge uh, congenial mood, I took the courage to broach something. Uh, uh, Hari Kesha once mentioned to me, I told that one day you are told by Rupa Goswami that you must go. Prabhupada's mood changed slightly, but that was open secret. He said dismissively, everyone knew, then he changed the subject. Hmm. So, Hari Kesha, he was, he's a disciple of Srila Prabhupada and he was also serving Srila Prabhupada sometimes. So, this is from Hari Sori Prabhu's diary. And Hari Sori Prabhu asked Hari Kesha. And Hari Kesha had told him about this. Hari Kesha had told him that Rupa Goswami had appeared to Prabhupada, like here you can see the artist drawing, Rupa Goswami appears to Prabhupada, maybe in a, in a spiritual form or a mystical form, we don't know how, but anyway Rupa Goswami came there to Prabhupada and he told him that you have to go. Uh, Rupa Goswami, you were told by Rupa Goswami that you must go. So Prabhupada didn't like to discuss that, but he said it was an open secret. Everybody knew. Rupa Goswami had personally come to Prabhupada's room there in Vrindavan at Radhadama and told him, don't just stay here in Vrindavan. You have to go to the West and then you have to preach. All right. And here's what Rupa Goswami is telling Prabhupada. Go ahead, Prabhu, read. Maharaja, don't worry about anything. Go ahead and travel to the west and preach. Just preach the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the chanting of Hare Krishna. You will be successful, I guarantee, because I will be right with you all the time. Who will be with them all the time? Who's going to be with Prabhupada all the time? Rupa Goswami. Yeah. Rupa Goswami. Yes, Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami said, don't worry. He said, I'll be with you all the time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wonderful, huh? All right. So that was how the Prabhupada went to the West under Rupa Goswami's order. So we want to understand the meaning of this book, which Rupa Goswami wrote. So Bhakti Ras Amrita Sindhu. So Bhakti, of course, we know the meaning of Bhakti. Bhakti means devotional service or loving and serving Krishna. Then Rasa is a more difficult word, difficult to put into English. So it's described here, the attractive feature or pleasure derived from any service which derive, which drives the servitor progressively on and on. It is a kind of mellow or relationship whose taste is very sweet. All right, do you have a good rasa? Sometimes we'll say, do you have a good rasa with that person? Oh yes, we have a nice rasa. We have a nice rasa. I mean, we have a nice relationship, we get along well, right? You have a good rasa? Mm, I hope so. <laughs> have a good rasa. Your husband and wife, they should have a good rasa. Right? Get along well with each other. Amrita. Amrita means, it can mean nectar, but it also means eternal or perpetual. Eternal. Perpetual means going on all the time, Amrita. It also means nectar, but 
this word, the meaning here in this case is eternal, and Sindhu means ocean, big ocean. So the ocean of devotional mellow. All right, go ahead, Prabhu. Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, the nectar of devotion teaches all men how to perform the simple and natural method of loving Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead. If we learn how to love Krishna, then it is very easy to immediately and simultaneously love every living being. The nectar of devotion, uh, devotion prefers 11 paragraph. Hmm, thank you. So, the nectar of devotion teaches all of us how to perform the simple, simple and natural method of loving Krishna. You see, sometimes people think, oh, it's so difficult, but Prabhupada says it's simple, very simple to love Krishna. It's not difficult. And it's also natural. It's within everyone. Everyone has the ability to love Krishna. It's within every living entity. Love of Krishna is within everyone. Why? Because Krishna is in everyone. So we all have a, a relationship with Krishna. And the person who we really love is Krishna. So Prabhupada said, if we learn how to love Krishna, then it's very easy to immediately and simultaneously love every living being. Why? Because every living being is a part and parcel of Krishna. So we don't just love only our family, we don't just love only our country, we, we don't just love only people, we love all living entities. We love the trees, we love the animals, we love the flowers, we love everything. Because they're all part and parcel of Krishna. Okay, Prabhu, read this. That, that Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the Sanskrit word, we have shortcut the translation, nectar of devotion. Rupa Goswami's purpose is to present the ocean of Bhakti Rasa. Rasa means mellow, the juice. It is just like ocean. This ocean has limitations, but that is unlimited. The nectar of devotion lecture, lecture Bombay. January 10, 1973. Yes, Prabhu, Prabhupada would give lectures on the nectar of devotion. And there was, a, there was one year Prabhupada called all the devotees to Vrindavan. This was before, before we even had a temple in Vrindavan. We didn't have any temple in Vrindavan. Prabhupada gave lectures at the, at the Radha Damodar temple. And Prabhupada lectured on the nectar of devotion. So all the de devotees went, not many, about, there was about 20 devotees there maybe, not many devotees in those days. About 20 people or so, they were in Vrindavan, because we had no temple. So it was very difficult. 1971, 1972, I think it was, and Prabhupada lectured on the nectar of devotion during the month of Kartik. The month of Kartik, Prabhupada was teaching the devotees how to observe the month of Kartik. So all the dev 20 devotees were there, all the senior devotees, and Prabhupada would give the class in the Radha Damodar temple from the nectar of devotion. He would read, Someone or someone would read a paragraph or a few sentences and then Prabhupada would talk and explain it. Have you heard those lectures? Did you all hear these lectures and Prabhupada lecturing on nectar of devotion? Have you ever heard them? Yes, some of them are. Some of them. Huh? Not all, Maharaj. Not all? Just a few. Just a few, okay. Are they translated to Chinese? 
Little avatar Maharaji, have you heard any lectures from Nectar of Devotion? Are they translated yet? No? Little avatar, are you there? Krishna, yes. Um, I didn't catch you. Sorry, just now. Are, have you heard any Prabhupada lectures on the nectar of devotion? Mm, not exactly, no. Have you heard any Prabhupada lectures? Yes. Did you hear? Yeah? No. Yes, I heard something. Melin, did you hear proper lecture? Yes, Maharaj, uh, yes, I had it here, but not so much. They are translating. Rajendra is translating some. He's writing. Oh, yes. yes. Did he translate yes. to Chinese? It's good for you to hear them. I will tell him to translate the Nectar of Devotion lectures. It will be yes. nice. You can, you can hear the lectures Prabhupada okay. gave on the Nectar of Devotion. Yes. Okay, so Prabhupada explains, he made the, the, the book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, he made it simple, just calls it Nectar of Devotion. So Rupa Goswami's purpose is to present the ocean of bhakti rasa. Rasa meaning mellow, mellow or relationship, the relationship of bhakti, relationship of devotion. Prabhupada also calls it the juice. Rasa is like a juice and he said it's just like ocean. So ocean of juice, just like you get ocean of salt water. We have the ocean of salt water here. But in the higher planets you have ocean of milk. Or you have ocean of sugar cane juice. Or you have ocean of mango juice. So this is the special ocean. The ocean of rasa. And this ocean has limitation. This ocean, meaning this ocean in the material world, the ocean which we know. We know Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, like that. But that, this ocean, Atlantic Ocean, that's limitation. Pacific Ocean also has limitation, but that ocean is unlimited. That ocean, meaning the Bhakti Ras ocean, is unlimited. Unlimited. The ocean of devotion. The ocean of devotional mellows or relationships with Krishna is unlimited. Okay, we'll go ahead. Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu compared bhakti to a great ocean. When he was speaking before Rupa Goswami, he said that it is just like an ocean. So I will take a drop of it and you test it and you will understand what is this ocean. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described a small portion of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Bhakti devotional service. There is a Ras taste and the taste is Amrita, eternal. The Nectar of Devotion lecture, Vrindavan, October 28, 1972. Mm, okay. So, Lord Chaitanya, you see this knowledge, this teaching about Bhakti, this is given by Lord Chaitanya to Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami, he, we said he was a direct disciple of Lord Chaitanya. So Lord Chaitanya taught him all about bhakti, about devotion. He, he, didn't, he taught him for ten days. There were ten days when they were together. They, and that was at, uh, they met at Prayak. 
at Prayag, where the Ganga meets the Yamuna. Right? So for ten days, Lord Chaitanya instructed Rupa Goswami about bhakti. And then Lord Chaitanya told Rupa Goswami to write the book. Go and write the book about Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So Rupa Goswami, after getting the teachings from Lord Chaitanya, then he went to Vrindavan. And when he was in Vrindavan, he wrote, he wrote the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So Lord Chaitanya explained to Rupa Goswami that Bhakti Rasa is a great ocean means unlimited. You, when you go in the ocean, it's so big. Oh, you, you, when you cross the ocean, it takes so long. You think, oh, why, why, we're still over the ocean. We haven't reached the land yet. It takes so long. Prabhupada saw, he went on the boat. Prabhupada took a boat to go to, from India to America. So he saw, oh, it takes such a long time just like the ocean to cross. So this, that ocean, the material ocean of water, that is limited, but the ocean of Bhakti Ras, that is unlimited. So Lord Chaitanya said, I'll take a drop of it and you taste it and you'll understand what is this ocean. We have to taste the drop of Bhakti. Just one drop, we can taste the full nectar of bhakti. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described a small portion of bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu because it's an ocean. You can't, you, can't, you can't tell everything about the ocean because it's so big. So he, he just described a small portion of it. But he, he, in that drop, there is taste, there is rasa, and the taste is amrita, eternal. So we want to understand these two points, these points, you see, that bhakti, within devotional service, there is this very special taste. We want to get that taste, and that taste is eternal. Once we taste the nectar, we'll never want to give it up. That is the real nectar, the real taste. That you, When you taste something so good, you always want it. You never want to give it up. You never want to leave. So that is the nature of bhakti, devotion. When we do devotion, when we really take up devotion, when we really become a devotee, we, we will never want any material taste again. We'll never be attracted to sense gratification or mundane life because the taste of bhakti is so good, it's so nectar, it's so pleasing that we never want to give it up. All right? Go ahead, Prabhu. Rasa, every service has some attractive feature which uh, drives the servitor progressively on and on. The force which drives the philanthropist, the householder and the nationalist is called Rasa or a kind of mellow relationship whose taste is very sweet. The next nectar of devotion. Preface, sixth paragraph. Right. So there has to be some something ve which is very pleasing, which is very attractive. Otherwise, we won't want to keep doing it. You know, just like in Krishna consciousness, we come to Krishna consciousness, we don't get any pay, we don't get any salary or anything, but we do it. Why do we do it? Why do we do this? Wake up so early in the morning and go to temple and do these things. Why do we do it? Because we're getting a special taste, a special pleasure from it. There's something very special in it, which we don't get in ordinary life, in the material world. We don't get that same pleasure. 
So Prabhupada talks about other people, he said, just like the ph philanthropist. A philanthropist, is a, you know, he wants to do good for other people. Maybe he gives charity and help the poor, like that. So why does he do it? He gets some pleasure from it. He gets some, some rasa. And then also the householder. The householder, just like the wife. The wife, she has to, she does things, she has to clean the house and she has to do the laundry and she has to clean and cook and shop and she's doing so many things. Why? Why does she do it? Because she gets some pleasure from it, that she, she gets some, the ple there's some special pleasure there in being with her family being with her husband or ch child, whatever, there's some special pleasure there. Although, we wonder, well, why, why bother doing all this? But there's some special rasa, there's some special taste and relationship there. And the same with the nationalist. Some people, they're very attached to their country. And we know how much some people, they'll fight for their country and they'll die for their country. They'll give their life for their country. You know, sometimes there are wars and the people will go out and fight and they'll be killed and be shot and sometimes taken prison, taken prisoner and tortured. They'll suffer all that. Why? Because they just do it for their country. They feel so attached to their country. So that is rasa. This is the relationship. And that, that rasa, that taste, will be very sweet. It should be very sweet. If it's not sweet, you won't do it. You won't, you won't want to keep doing it. If there's no sweet taste, we'll give up. Right? So we have to be getting, we have to get some taste. This is the important thing, that rasa. And it keeps us going. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Prabhu. Uh, uh, rasa, chapala sukha, the relish of or, or taste of the mundane ras, ras uh, does not long endure. Bhog tyaga, a, a position of alternating senses, uh, sense enjoyment and renunciation. Nectar of Devotion, prefers sixth paragraph. All right, so Prabhupada introduces, from the introduction, he introduces these two words for us, Sanskrit, chapala sukha. Sukha means happiness, and chapala means flickering, it means it's not, not always there. There's a little pleasure there, it comes and it goes. So it's like that, flickering happiness, doesn't last very long. Just like you work in a job, you have a job in the material world and you work, but then you, you want to know, when am I getting a holiday? When am I going to get a holiday? <laughs> you don't want to keep working, you can't keep working all the time. We, we want to get a break. Oh, come on, I, I've got to get a holiday, I need a rest, you know. You can't keep doing it. Why? You, you don't get the same pleasure. There's no real rasa. It's a material, mundane rasa. The mundane rasa does not last long. Does not last for a long time. So it's temporary, very temporary. Some pleasure for some time and then it's off. Just like you work all week, I want the weekend off. I'm not going to work on the weekend. I want to be at home. I want to have a rest. I'm not going to work on the weekend. People talk like that, right? They don't have the, the, the real taste. But devotees work every day. The devotees wake up every day. Every day come to Mangalarti. They don't take days off. We chant every day, right? Why? Because we get pleasure from it. We're, it's not mundane, but chapala sukha, that is the material world, mundane rasa. 
It's not very enjoyable. There's a little pleasure, but not for long. A little bit it soon goes. It's very temporary. And then, boga tiaga. Boga means enjoying. And tiaga means renouncing or giving up. So, in the material world, people are often influenced in that way. They have the mood about, they want to enjoy, and then they want to give it up. And then they want to enjoy again, and then they want to give it up. They want to renounce. Hmm. Boga Tiaga. Uh, What's a, a good example about boga and tiaga? Well, people like that, we're saying you work all week and then you want to enjoy. You get your holiday, you go and enjoy, you know. But how long do you enjoy for? How long do you go on holiday for? You will soon get tired. Just like people go to Thailand. They want to go to Thailand and they visit the beach at Thailand, they go to the beach at Phuket and they enjoy there. But how long they can stay there? After some time they will soon go back to work. They want to go back, oh no, no, I've been here long enough. And they get tired, they cannot enjoy it for very long. So boga, they enjoy for some time and then they give it up. And then more enjoyment, and then, oh, I'm tired, I'll give it up. So material life is like that. It's all temporary. The in pleasures of the material world are very short, very temporary. Somebody wants, you get, we want, I want to enjoy, and you enjoy, but how long can you enjoy? And then you'd get, okay, I renounce, I renounce. And you renounce for some time, okay, now I want to enjoy again. Just like sometimes people, they get married, and they want to enjoy. And then when it gets difficult, okay, and then I renounce, give it up. You want to leave the family, I'm, I renounce. I'm, I'm going to become single again. So I'm going to be a brahmachari. And you try to be a brahmachari again. Then, oh no, I think I want to get married again. You get married again. Then you get married and you enjoy, you have a relationship with a, a woman. But then after some, then I'm, oh no, we had an argument. No, I want to renounce and go back to spiritual life. I'll become a monk again. And become a monk. How long you'll be a monk? You won't be a monk for long. <laughs> then you want to enjoy again. So like that, boga tiaga, alternating, sometimes enjoying, and then you get tired of enjoying, then you want to give up, give up everything. But when you, you can't give up everything for very long, then you go back again into the material world and try to enjoy again. So this Mahalas, is... Does, does, does that mean that when something gets monotonous, that people just can't take it again? It becomes monotonous. Yes, you, you, you think it's becoming boring, monotonous, yeah, you see people can't take it, <laughs> the, the mind can because we want to enjoy, we want to enjoy so much, so we think, oh, I can't take it, it's so boring, we work in the factory, you work in the office or something, you work, the, you do these jobs, we get these jobs, so boring. And people get very tired of them after some time. I want to give up this work. I don't like this work. It's very boring, very monotonous. Do the same thing every day. And then, then you want to renounce. You give it up. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Do nothing? How long you can do nothing? How long you can re Are you just going to sit and do nothing? You can't do it. We have to, the nature of everyone is to do something. Nature of the soul is to be active. We need some activity. We have to find some activities to keep ourselves busy. It's the nature of the soul. 
to have relationships and to have exchanges with people. You cannot just be alone all, your, all the time, sit on your own all the time, just you and the wall and look at the wall. That's not natural. No, we have friends, we have relationships with people. So we have to find the proper platform, the proper way to enjoy. Otherwise, if it's material enjoyment, it will be very temporary and then we'll want to renounce. But how long we can renounce? We cannot renounce for very long, then again we want to enjoy. And then I want to renounce, and then I want to enjoy, and then I want to renounce. This way, back and forward. We never find the proper position, proper situation, because we don't have the proper relationship. We're not doing bhakti. We're not situated in devotional service. Devotional service means in relation to Krishna, working for Krishna. We're only thinking, enjoy the body, enjoy the senses. And then we think, renounce, renounce the body, renounce the senses. Can't do it. Right? You understand? Prabhu? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Are you okay with this? Yeah? Okay. All right, what's this? The nectar of devotion. We have to go to the preface. Let me get my book. Eighth paragraph of the preface. This is a very wonderful book. Everyone should have a book. I hope you have a book. You have a book? Yes. Okay, so go to the preface. That's right at the beginning of the book, after the index, the preface, and then the eighth paragraph. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, the paragraph begins. Bhakti Ras, Bhakti Rasa, however, the mellow relished in the transcendental loving service of the Lord does not finish with the end of life. It continues perpetually and is therefore called Amrita, that which does not die but exists eternally. Right? We have so many rasas. We have a rasa, we have the, of course, the family rasa, but the family is very temporary. It doesn't, it's not eternal. You know, family members grow up and they separate and they go away and some die. We all die eventually. All right? Have you got the book, Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. Can you read it for me then? Can you read after? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Bhakti rasa, however, the mellow relished uh, in the transcendental loving service of the Lord does not finish with the end of life. It continues perpetually and is therefore called Amrita, that which does not, uh, does not die but exists eternally. This is confirmed in all Vedic literatures. Bhagavad Gita says that a little advancement in Bhakti Rasa can save the devotee from the greatest danger, that of the missing the opportunity of human life. All right, who, knows, rasa, that, who, who knows that verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Prabhupada. Is it Neha Vikramana Shosti Pratyavayo Navityate? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, it is. Right. Do you know the translation? 
yeah uh, um, there is no loss or uh, diminution in even a little bit of service that we do to um, in, in in this path there is no loss or diminution in this path in this endeavor i think that is the word that Prabhupada uses and and uh, it, uh, we, uh, um, that will save us from the greatest danger right a little advancement saves us from the greatest what is the greatest danger being born in the lower species yeah losing the human form of life going into the lower form of life like the animal yes very good okay Prabhu go ahead the rasas derived from our feelings is in social life in family life or in the greater family life uh, of uh, altruism, philanthropy, nationalism, socialism, communism, etc. do not guarantee that one's next life will be a human being. We prepare our next life by our actual activities in the present life. A living entity <clears throat> is offered a particular type of body as a result of his action in the present body. These activities are taken into account by a superior authority known as Daiva or the authority of God. This Daiva is explained in Bhagavad Gita as the prime cause of everything and in Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated that a man takes his next body by Daiva Netrene which means by the supervision of the, uh, of the authority of the Supreme. In an ordinary sense, Daiva is explained as destiny. Daiva supervision gives us a body selected from 84 lakh forms. The choice does not depend on our selection but is awarded to us according to our destiny. If our body at present is engaged in the activities of Krishna consciousness, then it is guaranteed that we will have at least a human body in our next life. A human being engaged in Krishna consciousness, even if unable to complete the course of Bhagavad Bhakti Yoga, takes part in a higher division of human society so that he can automatically further his advancement in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, all bona fide activities in Krishna consciousness are amrita or permanent. This is the subject matter of the nectar of devotion. Yes, thank you Prabhu. Very good. Alright. So, this, these activities which we do in Krishna consciousness, they are eternal. Right? Mentioned here. Bhakti Ras, however. The mellow reg relished in the transcendental loving service of the Lord does not finish with the end of life. It continues perpetually and is therefore called Amrita, that which does not die but exists eternally. So that's what we want to taste. Any action performed for the satisfaction of Krishna in this transcendental bhakti rasa stage of life can be relished perpetually. When one is thus engaged in devotional service, all varieties of rasas or mellows turn into eternity. When we do devotional service, that is, if we're doing devotional service, then these rasas, they become eternal eternal relationships we can go on doing them forever okay so now we have a little exercise for you we want you to look through the preface and just try think what are some reasons for Prabhupada writing the nectar of devotion why did Prabhupada write this book and why these are why are these things important for you individually and society at large, right? We're going to do it groups, right? How many people are here in the class? 
Prabhu, how many people are here today? Hare Krishna? Eleven of us, Prabhu. You're eleven? Okay. Yes. All right. So, eleven people. Okay. So, we'll, we can put the three ladies in one group, right? Three Chinese ladies will go in one group. Okay. Just for today. We'll put them in one group and then that will be group one. And then how many other, other ladies have we got? Two. Only, only two more ladies are there. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there will be group number two. And then, how many men are left? There must be six. Six. One, yes. One, two, three, four, five. And yes. Five or six. Five, I think five. Five. Okay. One. So, so we have to make two groups from the men. Right? Okay, ma. Okay. Make divide the five men into two groups. One okay. one group of men will be group three, and the other group of men will be group four. Okay. Yes, I right? Okay. So group one and group three, you have to look at the at paragraphs five and eight to ten. So you have to count the paragraphs in the book and paragraph 5 and paragraphs 8 to 10 to get your answers. And group B, uh, the other group, groups 2 and group 4, you have to do, you have to look at paragraphs 11 to 13 in the preface. Is it clear what you have to do? Yes. Yeah. Little avatar marriage, Kojai Mai? You understand? Yes. Okay, have you got the detail? Paragraphs 8 to 10, you're looking at paragraph 5 and paragraph 8 to 10? Yes. Mm -hmm. And these are the questions again. Why Prabhupada wrote the book and why these reasons? The Prabhupada wrote the book, why they are important for us, individually and for the society. Okay, Maharaj, I have created four rooms. Okay, very good, Prabhu. Thank you. So, sh shall I open all rooms? Yeah. Open yeah, the, the first room one, it's uh, Bhaktin mailing. Lila Avatari Devidasi and Sitala Devidasi. Yes. Room 2 is S. Narayani Devidasi and Sobha Mai Keshavi Devidasi. And room number 3 is Bhakta Vatsal Narasimha, Dev, uh, Narasimha Devdas, Elias Jang, Vivu Chaitanya. And room number 4 is Sashikant and myself. Okay. Very good. Okay. So. So I'll open the rooms for Yes, you. open the rooms, yeah. Yes. You have ten minutes. Okay.
Sashikant Prabhu is not joined in my room. Really? Yes, he has not yet joined. Sashikant. Where is he? Is he there? Can you can you please can you please close this uh, presentation? Screen share. Can you please stop this tension? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I can see where is it participants. Because I'm uh, yeah I, I'm logged in with two devices. One is as a Mayapur Institute and one as myself. Mm. So she can't. No, it's gone. Huh? Yeah, he's gone. Sashikant is gone. Let me see. Uh, he's, he's messaging me. Ah, uh, Sashikant has called me up. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So he's there now, Prabhu. Shashi Khan should be there. Yes, Prabhu, yes,
Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. I think we can close the rooms, Prabhu. You can close the rooms? Yeah, I think, we, I think we have to close the rooms now. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm closing the rooms. Maharaj told. <laughs> progress, 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 progress. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. I need to do Okay, everyone's back in, back with us. <laughs> Just to... Hare Krishna. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yes. All right. So we will start with. We'll start with group one. Who's the spokes who's the representative for group one? Yes. Who's the representative there? Melin, Lila Avatar or Sitala? Yeah, Guru Maharaj, I can say the first and uh, Lila Avatar. And the Sitala Mataji can also add something. I'm lost. Okay, good. So after after we we are yeah after we are uh, discuss and we find some more important point. So the first point we from the uh fra, uh put uh we from the file uh, uh yes and there is. The persons engaged in the Krishna consciousness movement may take advantage of this great literature and be very solid seated in Krishna consciousness. And there is also um, the nectar of devotion teaches us how to stimulate our original love for Krishna and how to be situated in that position where we can enjoy our blissful life. Okay. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And the other uh, important point, and the Lila Avarta Mataji can continue. Mm -hmm. mm. Hare Krishna. Um, uh, in paragraph 8, uh, it said that uh, uh, when uh, the purified senses are employed in the service of the Lord, uh, one becomes situated in Bhakti Rasa life. Uh, I think this is the purpose of uh, why Papa write this Bhakti Rasa. Uh, in order, um, by, by, by this uh, sadhana process, um, to Teach us how to um, purify our existence. 
and uh, becomes uh, and finally becomes automatic and spontaneous uh, eagerness to serve the Lord. Hare Krishna. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Sitala Mataji, would you like to add anything? Yes, but I will try to speak English. <laughs> that uh, uh, night we also they also mentioned we are uh, always be uh, teaching by we should love someone and like love our country love our family but uh, uh, we don't know which one we love is um, most happiness so we uh, should Papa read this uh, uh, the Nectar of devotional is teach us we should uh, uh, to love Krishna and uh, uh, like this. Oh, very nice. Yeah, good. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, let's hear from group number three. They were working on the same section. Who's in group number three? There were some men. Yes? Is it? For us the time was a little short, but maybe I have not so many points, then I can start and then you can add your points. Good idea? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, one point is it's uh, why we should... And the reasons why Prabhupada wrote an act of devotion is because I found out it's a signpost he writes that we have a yeah, plan where we should walk. And then the relevance for us is because if we practice this what is written there we get in the next life for sure a human form of life in a higher position and then we can easily start again with devotional service and we're getting free from fear and there's an object where we can direct our love to that's Krishna and yeah and there's the process of devotion uh, service written and so we have a plan what we should do. Okay, yeah, good. And for you personally, why, why, you, why you think this book is important for you? What, what are you going to get out of it personally? Um, Haribo, I can add on. So uh, in the eighth paragraph, it is mentioned that uh, it will immediately bring one to a spacious life free from anxieties and will bless one with transcendental existence. So it will keep you happy and not stressed out and in anxiety of all time. Oh. When you have all the material work and everything coming in, the only way you can look at it is to just uh, love the Supreme Lord and just uh, do devotional services upon to him. Okay, good. Get free of anxiety. No, no anxiety. Yeah, bliss. Thank you very much. Very good. Okay, let's hear group number two, the ladies. So we had to uh, look at paragraphs, the last three paragraphs basically. So in this, Prabhupada mainly highlights the point on loving Krishna. Um, so he says that uh, it is required to, uh, you know, create peace and harmony in the human society. He speaks about the United Nations, attempts of the United Nations, which, um, uh, you know, were futile in terms of creating peace and harmony because they are missing the right point, the actual point. So he's speaking about a very natural and simple method of loving Krishna. So if we learn to love Krishna, then we'll start looking at everybody as parts and parcels of Krishna and we'll love everybody. Therefore, uh, that brings about the peace. And, um, and that, that he also compares it with uh, pouring water on the root of the tree. So now what's happening is we are pouring water all over. Therefore, the main point is uh, missing. And um, and then he also speaks about how uh, uh, countries like um, you know US, America, which is the richest nation, having all material facilities, but still there is dissatisfaction, and there is uh, there are people are still not happy. So um, uh, there, there he's speaking about uh, how these men are confused in learning because they don't know the art of devotional service. 
therefore this book is written in order to reach such souls and uh, by reading which he's saying he's sure that the fire of material existence burning within the hearts will be immediately extinguished and also he gives us practical uh, he says this book net of devotion will give us practical hints on how we can live in this material world being perfectly engaged in devotional service thereby fulfilling all our desires in this life and the next so the whole point he is he is not condemning the material life but the attempt is to give people uh, um, information about how to love krishna so the real point is keeping krishna in the center of all our activities so he also says that this is specifically meant for people who are engaged in krishna consciousness which means the devotees uh, right now we have to take it up and personally um, apply these in our daily lives for me also i would take it up as uh, an instruction to lead our material life keeping krishna in the center of all our activities oh wonderful thank you very thank much you. very nice thank you, hi krishna yes the, uh, and the other group group number 4 do we have a spokesman Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So, Maharaj, uh, <coughs> so Prabhupada is writing that uh, some, some and substance of this book, uh, Nectar of Devotion, is to find the object of supreme love. Actually, in this world, we find that people so they begin with loving their brother, sister, father, but then eventually they become dissatisfied and they, they are have breakups. Brother fights with brothers. Brother fight with sister like this, this so many fightings go on, so there's different effects on them. They start loving their nation, society, nation in this way. But then ultimately no one is satisfied. Because they they don't know who is the ultimate object of love. So this NOD, this nectar of devotion, this book is going to uh, give us the real object of love, that is Krishna. And then when we love Krishna, then we automatically become satisfied. So and um, and the point Prabhupada made that by this uh, nectar of devotion uh, teaches us the science of perfectly loving every living entity by loving Krishna. Because if we love Krishna, then we love automatically love everyone, every living entity because they are part and parcel of Krishna. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we based on this nectar of devotion, we can accomplish which United Nation has held. United Nation was made to bring peace in the world. But it has totally failed because they have not recognized the Krishna, the ultimate the center point. And but through bringing Krishna in the center, we can unite everyone. Yes. So, right. And uh, third one, Maharaj, in this material world, actually everyone in, in, in Western countries, especially Prabhupada giving example, they have every material, every possible material facility. But still they are not satisfied they are confused that are, we have everything but still why we are not satisfied and the Prabhupada is saying that this book Nectar of Devotion will teach them how to live happily in this material world by engaging in devotional service so this book will teach them the art of devotional service which will extinguish the fire of material existence in which their every whole world is burning so in this way so the practical application for me is that I can learn personally the art of devotional service management from this book. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Very nice. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Nice to hear everyone's responses. Very good. Okay. So we'll just, let's see, we'll just finish off here. Let's see. We have our objectives, what we discussed today. We talked about the significance of Rupa Goswami his importance, and we talked about the title, we explained Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and now we've been hearing about our experience of relishing eternal rasa in Krishna consciousness, right? We want to taste more this rasa in Krishna consciousness. And we've been looking at Prabhupada's purposes in writing the book and discussing relevance. All right, concluding quote, it is only for our guidance that Rupa Goswami prepared his book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which is now presented in the form of the nectar of devotion. 
Persons engaged in the Krishna consciousness movement may take advantage of this great lit literature and be very solidly situated in Krishna consciousness. Jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Okay, so any questions? Anybody has any question on today's class? I have one. Okay, 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 I'll ask. I have a simple question from today's classes. Like, we have just understood that uh, we get this human form because, uh, because in our last birth, we had some sort of bhakti or uh, or love for God or quest for Krishna. That's why we have got this human form, right, Maharaj? So in that case, like everybody who are human beings right now, they might have some love or some affection from, for Krishna in their past life, whatever uh, life they had. So why, so why uh, in this human form, only few people are uh, looking for Krishna and not everybody? Well, it's not that everybody got a human form is looking for Krishna. But you get the human form after you get rid of your karma. You work off your bad karma, <laughs> which put you in the animal body or the lower planets. When we work off that karma, then we come back to the human body. The human body is the place where we get the karma. Right? We come to the human form of life. This is the place, this is where we're earning our karma. And it will determine where we go, when we go up or we go down. So we come to this human form of life. It's, it's not that everybody's got going to be looking for, Krish, for Krishna, but we get the human body, we come in this material world because we want to enjoy, we want to ex exploit, we're, we're, we want to even imitate Krishna. That's why we're here in the material world. We have desires. We want to enjoy the material world, we want to exploit the material world for our own sense gratification. And, and we get the human body, it's an opportunity for us to earn the karma. What kind of karma are you going to do? Are you going to do good karma or bad karma? Not that everybody got a human body is looking for Krishna. The human body is just an opportunity for people to satisfy their senses in a more cultured manner. So don't think everybody got the human body is looking for Krishna. But we earn the karma in the human body. This is the place where we get the karma. We will determine where we go from here, how we live in this world, what we do with this body. It's very rare to be a devotee of Krishna. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, nobody's, hardly anybody's endeavoring for, for perfection. And most of those who are looking for perfection are mayavadi. So devotees are very, very rare. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mahal. Yes, some other question. Shashikan has a question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes Maharaj. I had this question Maharaj, just like we have supplementary book for Bhagavad Gita, like uh, Surrender Back to Me by Gurukhya Burijan Prabhu. Yes. So do, do we have some similar supplementary book for Krishna Maharaj? Yes, there, there is one book, it's called Waves of Devotion. Waves okay. of Devotion. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I have some soft copies, I'll try to get soft copies of the, some of it and I'll send it to you. You don't need the whole book, okay. but uh, I, I, when I get the soft copies, I think Jan Mastami Prabhu is sending me some files and I'll forward to you and you can download it, the soft copy. Thank you, thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we'll send to all the students. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? Okay, so we'll meet tomorrow, same time. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna. Hey.